So, uh, today is our second lecture on women in Islam. And you've had a chance to take a look at the Quran. Um, so we're going to go through some of the passages that I asked you, so we can go ahead and, and um, record it from now on. Um, so I asked you to look at first just two passages in the Quran, two surahs, that are uh, just give you a general flavor of the Quran. So you looked at Surah 1 and Surah 96. So let's just look at them briefly. So Surah 1, the opening, is very brief, but it gives you the main points of Islam. So in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. So no matter what else you hear about Islam, the God that they're worshiping, they keep repeating, gracious and merciful. So you might hear these things about Islam being um, uh, wanting to harm outsiders or something, but there are repeated passages within the Quran about Allah being merciful and gracious. Praise be to Allah. So that sounds a lot like the Hebrew Bible and like Christian scriptures. Cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment, you do we worship, your aid do we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, those whose portion is not wrath, who do not go astray. So this probably sounds pretty familiar to people who have been raised in a Christian or a Jewish background. Um, there is a day of judgment in Christianity and uh, in some passages in the Hebrew scriptures, prophets speak of a day of judgment as well. So um, let's look now at, and let's notice that this doesn't start out in the beginning, you know, Genesis. So one thing we have to notice when we look at the Quran is that it's not um, chronologically organized. The Bible looks somewhat chronologically organized. And even within a particular book, um, it's not all one subject. It can talk about an issue of um, relationships within a family. It can talk about Moses. It can talk about uh, the mention of Genesis or the creation or the, the uh, judgment day. But it doesn't go chronologically through any subject. Um, Let's turn to Surah 96, which is the one that was the first message that Muhammad got. And it starts with this word ikra, which is sometimes translated recite or proclaim. It can also be translated read. It starts out in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Ikra, read or proclaim in the name of your Lord and Creator, who created humans out of a mere bit of blood. So um, those, are, those are two chapters of the Quran that give us just the general flavor. Uh, the next ones that I asked you to look at were chapter 4, which is even titled, The Woman. So we don't have that in the Hebrew or Christian scriptures, right? Or even in the Enumi Elish, we don't have specific attention to the issue of women. That tells us, for one thing, that we are in the seventh century. So let's re let's review the dates of where we are in history. So we have the first century, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. First century, we have life of Jesus. Second century, we have uh, some controversy over how to handle social issues and conform or go ahead and do radical missionary work and not worry about having children and having families. Third century, we have a lot of deaths and persecution. Fourth century, we have Constantine coming into the picture and making Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire and calling some councils to decide different creeds for the Christian church. 
uh, 5th century, we have the fall of the Roman Empire. We have barbarians invading and Rome's government, which has lasted for hundreds of years, collapsing. 6th century, the main thing we need to know about is we have Muhammad born. So he's 570 to 632. So we're in the 7th century now. And um, women's roles are a bit of an issue. They're, they weren't an issue back in, well, they were once an issue in the Roman Empire when we had women's clothing and use of jewelry legislated against for the wealthy women. And then we had the little fight back where they got that repealed. But other than that, we don't have too many mentions of women as an issue and how to handle women's issues. Um, we have women as an issue in the second century among Christians. but. By the time we get to the 7th century, um, in the revelations that Muhammad gets from God, we have this whole chapter on issues relating to women. Um, I want to read to you from two main commentators, women who study the Quran and women. So this one is called Believing Women in Islam, Unreading Patriarchal Interpretations of the Quran. It's by Asma Barlas, and it's a few years old. It's um, uh, written in 2002. So she's saying, we have a lot of interpretations of the Quran that are interpreted by men and for men. She said, it's time some women started looking at these passages and trying to understand what they meant when Muhammad first received the revelations, what culture they came into in the seventh century, and what the exact translation is of these words, many of which aren't in common use today, and then how we apply them in the 21st century. Uh, another person who's a major commentator on the Quran is Amina Wadud. She writes the Quran and Woman, rereading the sacred text from a woman's perspective. So these are two sources that I'll be using to um, discuss the issue of women in the Quran. So I'm going to read you a paragraph from Amina Wadud's book on page 9. And Amina Wadud is a, an American, African-American convert to Islam. She started out being raised with a father who was a pastor in the Washington, D.C. area. She, in college, converted to Islam and is now well known as a leader for uh, scholarship in the Quran and for women's issues. So we'll read a quotation from her about looking at the Quran and looking at women's issues. She says, um, the mere fact that the Quran was revealed in 7th century Arabia, when Arabs held certain perceptions and misconceptions about women and were involved in certain lewd practices against them, resulted in certain statements in the Quran against those, thing ha those things happening. So she says some of the things that had to be prohibited in the Quran were infanticide, especially putting out baby girls to die. So that was, a, that was a practice in the ancient world in general, in poor places, places where they didn't want another mouth to feed or especially another baby girl. Maybe they wanted a boy for cultural reasons or inherit property. So infanticide, killing, leaving out of baby, babies or um, kill, deliberately killing babies occurred. The Quran speaks against that. It speaks against sexual abuse of slave girls, which was widespread, which we even we find out about today in, in the world today. Uh, it speaks against the denial of inheritance to women. And um, it's, it gives specific rules and guidelines for inheritance. It doesn't look 100% 50-50 to us today, but it's making a statement that you have to have some plan for giving women inheritance. Um, other passages don't prohibit something that's an injustice to women. She says other practices just had to be modified. Polygamy, unconstrained divorce, conjugal violence, and concubine. <laughs> having concubines, for example. Um, 
it says, with other practices, the Quran doesn't make a comment. It doesn't even restrain it. We might not like it today, but in, in the seventh century, um, the revelation that Muhammad got did not make a comment on social patriarchy, um, marital patriarchy, so rule of husbands in the culture and in the home. No comment on that. Economic hierarchy, division of labor between males and females. And then she says, um, some women today may openly question why is it neutral on things like men's leadership in the home and in the society. And she says, we have to look at the evolution of the text and the evolution of, the, of ideas. So in the seventh century, the Quran makes some statements that limit things happening in the seventh century that are harmful to women, but it doesn't um, it doesn't outright say um, things like one husband, one wife. But it does limit from any number of wives, if you're wealthy, to four. And then it makes statements about how you have to treat your wives if you're going to have more than one. And so what feminists do today is they take those statements and they say the Quran is moving in this direction toward fairness for people and fairness for women. So let's take that general progress and continue it to the 21st century. But what other commentators say is, if the Quran said that in the 7th century, that's what we have to do exactly today. They aren't going to say the Quran in its century is trying to make improvements for women's status, so we need to continue to do that. So there's debate today. Um, Two things I want to look at before we look at some of the difficult passages are the issues of creation and the hereafter. So let's look at chapter 4, verse 1, or Surah 4, verse 1. We see in that verse, O mankind, reverence your creator who created you from a single person a single soul it's sometimes translated and the actual word is nafs n-a-f-s created you from a single nafs created of like nature its mate and from the two created uh, scattered seeds countless men and women and then it says reverence Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights reverence the wounds that bore you for all that ever watches over you. So the very first thing it says in this surah having to do with women is respect your mothers. Respect women. Uh, and what it also points out before it says specifically respect mothers it says you all male and female were created from a single being not. Interesting that in Hebrew so Hebrew and Arabic are languages that are closely related. And uh, in Hebrew, the word is nefesh. And it means soul or body. There's, these are two separated in Hebrew, but a single being. Um, and so this word nafs um, is beautiful because it's not gender related. It's not. Um, from a man. So if we look at Genesis, we see in Genesis 2 and 3, there's Adam, and then Adam is put to sleep, and then we have Eve. So we discussed in this class how Adam might not necessarily be male. We don't have genders till he wakes up and we have male, female. But in the Quran, it's even more clear. In this verse, it just says you're all created from a single being, a single bit and um, male and female of like nature. So we have simultaneous creation of men and women. We don't have men first followed by women. And we don't have um, anything like uh, a man being who gets to do everything and then the woman comes into the picture. It's simultaneous and it's equal. So it's important to notice that in the very beginning of chapter four. Um, Let's skip now to a mention of the hereafter. 
And actually, I didn't ask you to read Surah 3, but let's look at one of the last lines of Surah 3. Um, so verse 195 in chapter 3 of the Quran says that God has promised, never will I suffer to be lost the work of any of you, be he male or female. You are members one of another. Those who have left their homes or been driven out from them or suffered harm in my cause. Verily, I will blot out from them their iniquities, so I will forgive them and admit them into gardens with rivers flowing beneath, a reward from the presence of Allah. And from God's presence is the best of rewards. So we have equal rewards in heaven for men and women. You always hear about, oh, if you if you die in the cause of um, fighting for your faith, then the men will get how many virgins? Some number of virgins. Um, but here in the Quran, <coughs> We have the statement that men and women both get rewarded equally. Uh, I won't suffer to be lost the work of any of you, be he male or female. So the things that you've done in your life and the work that you've done for Allah, well, um, you, it will not be lost and you will get a reward from Allah. So um, that's one thing that both of these scholars Asma Barlas and Amina Wadu point out is the equality in the hereafter for men and women, even though you don't hear about that as much. And I'll read one more passage from that, on that subject from Surah 40, um, which I didn't ask you to read. So lines 39 to 41 say, um, the person that works evil um, will be requited with the like thereof, the person that works a righteous deed, whether man or woman, and is a believer, will enter the garden. So isn't it nice that the Quran keeps saying, male or female, man or woman, you both get the same reward. And it mentions men or women in the creation description. Yes? I'm just a little confused because it just feels like you could spin it any way you want. Like, I was very disturbed by Surah 4, verse yeah. 34. Like, okay. This is if they, if women, the men are to be the maintainers of women, and the, if they engage in ill conduct, beat them. Okay. Yeah, let's look at the hard passages now. Those were the easy ones where we say, wow, equality, and even specifically bothering to mention <clears throat> women and men. You don't have that when you go back to the time that the Ten Commandments were written. You don't have specifically male or female added in, and you don't have that in the Christian scriptures. I don't think you have any PS. This applies to both men and women. But you do have that here. But let's look at the hard, the hard passages now uh, within Surah 4 on women. Um, which one will we do first? Um, well, uh, let's look at the, the uh, third line. After we've gone through the first line, we'll look at Surah 4, <coughs> line 3, where the Quran says, um, well, I guess we have to look at number 2, too. Just after it says, respect your mother, it says, restore the property of orphans to them. Do not substitute worthless things. So this is their inheritance. If an orphan has an inheritance, don't steal it. Don't give them something worthless in place of what you took from them. Do not devour their substance by mixing it up with your own. And in the third line of, the, of Surah 4, if you fear that you will not be able to deal justly with the orphans, marry women of your choice, two or three or four. But if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with them, then only one. And then it says, or, and then the Quran always has these little parentheses where the translator is putting in words that are implied. Did you find that when you were reading the Quran that you had to deal with all these parentheses? So in this line it says, or in parentheses, a captive that your right hands possess. But all of these arrangements on how to handle orphans, like you can marry a couple of them, 
are to prevent you from doing injustice. So, in the same line we have, wow, you can marry up to four, or you can have up to four wives. But there are two qualifiers against it. One is, if you're able to deal justly with them. And finally, this is all to prevent you from doing injustice. So, what these commentators do when they look at this passage is they say, wow, this passage doesn't say a wealthy man can just have as many wives as he wants. It says, if there's a problem of orphans, and if their property is going to be mixed up in your own, and you're concerned that you won't be able to deal justly with them and raise them from 4 till 15 or whatever marriageable age, then you can marry them. So, Marriage, multiple marriage, comes up in a context of providing for unprovided for people in the society. So this is a, we're in a world where, let's see, we have, we don't have Saudi Arabia, well we don't have a map of Saudi Arabia, but um, we're in a world where there's a, a civilized culture along the, uh, along the, the, uh, is it the Red Sea? The Red Sea. And we have um, desert for a large part of the peninsula. And life is hard, and making a living is hard. And if, if there are wars, and widows, and orphans, and somebody's unprovided for, <coughs> that's what this surah is trying to provide for. So, um, what these women who study the Quran say is, they say, okay, we don't like this idea of up to four wives, but look at that qualifier. If you fear that you will not be able to deal justly, just one. They also look at a verse at the very end of this same chapter, which says, verse 129 of, of Surah 4, you are never able to be fair and just as between wives, even if it is your ardent desire. Um, but do not turn away from a woman altogether and leave her unprovided for. Um, come to a friendly understanding and practice restraint. So um, there's also another uh, quotation in... Uh, um, I think that's the main one that they refer to. So, yes, we have polygamy allowed. We have marriage allowed to several women. But it's in a context of providing for them and being fair. And if you can't be fair, don't do it. You know what 20th century Muslims say? Uh, feminists? Actually, most women, most Muslims that are in cities and in um, uh, cultures that are influenced by um, education and equal opportunity, they will not ordinarily have a husband with more than one wife. They'll have a single marriage, possibly in lower class cultures an extra wife. Uh, but um, what women will say who analyze the Quran is they say, well, yeah, you can have up to four wives if you're allowed if you are actually able to be fair, but the Quran says you're never able to be fair. So what, what scholars say about the Quran is that it makes some changes to the culture of the 7th century, but it institutes ideas that are eventually going to be interpreted to make further changes in the direction of justice for all people. So it doesn't come right out of the 7th century and say things like, oh, men and women should be equal in your whole culture. Forget patriarchy. It's a patriarchal culture. It, it really can't do that, but it plants seeds that make changes. Um, let's see. Let's go a little further in this passage and look at even a more difficult passage, which is the one that um, mentions what to do in cases of a marriage when there's discord when there's disagreement and possibly a divorce happening. So um, let's go to verse 34, which is just a few lines down. And 
So, um, actually, I guess we're, uh, let's, let's go to 34. Um, and so this verse in the Quran says, men are the protectors and maintainers of women, because Allah has given the one more strength than the other, and because they support them from their means. So this is a description of the culture in the 7th century. Therefore, the righteous women are devoutly obedient and guard in their husband's absence that which Allah would want them to guard. Then it says, as to those women from whom you fear disloyalty and ill conduct, um, it has several stages. First, admonish them or talk to them. Here we're having advice for husbands. If you're gone and your, your wife is not doing what she should be doing in your absence or there's a disagreement among between you, first admonish them, that means talk it over. Second, sleep in separate beds, separate rooms. Third, um, and it says last, I'm sorry, it says last, beat them lightly. And if they refuse to return to obedience, do not seek to annoy them any further, for Allah is above both of you. Um, and then the next line says, if you fear a divorce between you and your wife, appoint two arbiters, one from her family, one from his family, and let them do the reconciliation and the decision. So this is not a culture where the husband can just say, boom, you're divorced, which was the case in first century Israel. This is a culture where as according to the Quran's guidelines, um, there has to be some mediation and some arbitration. So these are, again, um, guidelines that are trying to help women in a culture where women don't have very much help and support. Um, let's look at that controversial word, to beat them. Did anybody comment on that in your paper that you gave for me today? I did. You commented on it. You said, what is this? That's very long. Okay. Let's look at what some of our commentators say about that. Um, and actually, let me at this point go through some guidelines for interpreting the Quran that are very similar to the guidelines we looked at when interpreting the Hebrew scriptures or the Christian scriptures. So first of all, um, avoid any traditional interpretations that you hear all the time that are probably the dominant cultural message. Secondly, avoid strong reactions against the text, like, well, throw the Quran out, it says to be women. Um, third, look for interpretations that carefully study each passage in light of the whole passage and in light of the Quran as a whole. Um, fourth, look at the seventh century and find out what was happening then, what kinds of wife beating were happening then, and then look at this statement in that context. And actually, what, what these women commentators have come up with is there was a lot of widespread abuse, um, not even up to the extent of killing, just, and that still happens today. We have domestic violence, don't we? But what they're saying is this is a scripture that is trying to carefully limit and control this problem. And it does use that word, beat them lightly, so let's look at the trans. Uh, the next uh, the next guideline is look at the grammar and the meaning of each word in the original Arabic. So don't just take the English translation. Um, so beat them. Parenthesis lightly. So let's look at what that word actually is. So that word is daraba. And what scholars do is they say. Where else has this word occurred? What does it mean and what does it do? So this is the word in question as it's translated, transliterated into English letters. And they notice that there's another word in Arabic that has two R's. And this one is a lot stronger. This is beat hard. And this is beat light, if it is beat. And they're, they're debating whether it, whether it is, whether it even means B. But this one is much stronger. 
So you, you can say from English, well, why would one letter make that much difference anyway? But maybe if you're a speaker of Spanish, you can relate to it. There's a big difference in pronunciation, right? So if you have a double R, Araba is a strong pronunciation. I'm sure I'm not doing it right. And Daraba is soft. It's just not as strong a word. So this one is a stronger one. This one is the one that Quran uses. Um, and they say that it means strike is one possible, the main meaning of it that you might see in other places. Um, this one is strike repeatedly or intensely. This one is strike. Um, we get other interpretations of what the word actually means. So we have Asma Barlas saying, where has this word occurred and what does it mean in those situations? She says, in fact, it's questionable whether Daraba even refers to striking a wife. So she says maybe it means more prevent. So if you read the, that meaning, you read um, refuse to share their beds and prevent them. Like just keep them in one place and you in another place. Um, prevent them from going outside the house. Prevent them from getting so close to you that you're going to have domestic violence. Um, another source that she looks at says that another possible meaning is holding in confinement. So kind of like confine or just keep separate from you during this period when you're waiting for the family negotiation between the uh, representative from the husband's family the representative from your family. Um, so um, she says it's not necessarily beat. It could be more prevent or restrain. And it's not the strong beating. But when you look at the historical interpretation of the passage, what do you think most men have looked at when they saw that passage? What did they thought it meant? If you just look at Adam and Eve, and people look at Adam and Eve's story and say, oh good, men get to rule over women. So in this passage, you'll get a lot of Muslim men who say, oh, see, we get to beat our wives. <laughs> so they're not really trying to look at what God is intending in this passage. Um, and um, another thing that the scholars point out is, you can't just take this passage all by itself and say, this is how this is how men and get to treat their wives. You have to look at, at it in the context of the whole Quran. It says justice, deal kindly, um, mercy, all of these other important um, views about how to relate between people. So you don't just pull out one verse and say, OK, green light, we get to abuse. But that's how it's been interpreted. Yes? Isn't that kind of like how we interpret with the Bible? Exactly. We have the same verse, problems. But yeah, the same problems. And actually, um, I'm quoting to you from a little teeny Quran with no notes. But it's just like the Bible. You should, yeah, it's just like Shakespeare. You shouldn't even take a verse like that and just read one little English translation and say, OK, I got the meaning of it. Read it in a Bible like this one that has a half page of notes on the bottom of every page. and. Um, I'll turn to the passage in question and read you a little bit from their notes. Um, well, actually, I'll do that for the next difficult passage that we're going to do. We're not out of time yet. Good. We have 10 more minutes to do another difficult passage. Um, but um, let's going back to verse 34. Um, so the footnote here says the word Daraba is used in the Quran with about 17 different meanings, including avoid, separate, leave, travel. Then it says the Quran is best interpreted through the deeds and sayings of the Prophet. So how do we interpret the Quran? We look at other things that Muhammad said and did. 
the fact that the prophet never battered or hit any wife and detested any such action gives credence to the meaning intended here as stay away from a discordant wife in hope that the separation and the negotiation will either arrange a divorce or keep the marriage. But it's, this footnote says, look at it in a larger picture. Don't just grab the first obvious meaning of the 17 that are available. Um, okay, let's look at another difficult passage, and that's a few lines earlier, line 15 of the chapter on women. So let's look at, um, here's another situation where there's discord in the home. Um, and I'll look at it in this slide, in this Quran. Um, okay, if we look at line 13, it's talking about limits set by Allah on those who obey Allah and his messenger. They will be admitted to the gardens with rivers flowing. Those who disobey and transgress will be admitted to fire and a humiliating punishment. The very next line discusses problems within relationships. It says, if any of your women are guilty of, and it's usually translated lewdness, and um, the actual line here um, is, um, it refers to adultery or fornication. So if any women are guilty of it, take the evidence of four witnesses, um, confine them to houses until death do claim them, or Allah ordain for them some other way. The next line says, if two men among you are guilty of, and it says the same word, Punish them both. If they repent and amend, leave them alone, for Allah is oft returning, most merciful. So these are these are weird little guidelines for legal situations that are sexual, involving some kind of sexual contact in the seventh century. We're not gonna really figure it out in the 21st century, are we? We're not gonna really know what the Quran meant here and what happened why uh, this is being addressed. But let's look at some of the um, viewpoints of some of the scholars commentating. So we could just do the, the obvious, what's the obvious way that somebody might look at this? They might say, oh, there's disagreement, and the wife is guilty of adultery or fornication. Or it doesn't say wife. Any of your women could be a daughter. Then you get to confine her, have some witnesses, and just leave her confined until death takes her? That would be the obvious and crudest interpretation. And that has actually happened in some fundamentalist groups in Saudi Arabia and in, in some parts of the world. That has happened. People have said, see, I get to confine her and just let her starve to death. But people who are more carefully reading the Quran say, interesting that verse 15 is about women who do something. And verse 16 is about men, two men who do the same thing. So they're saying in verse 16, it looks like it's talking about homosexual contact. In the first one, um, we're not sure, but it's some kind of sexual contact. Um, they say that um, the emphasis here is on witnesses. So they get a trial. They get some, some um, it says reliable witnesses. The second emphasis is confine them, and then those that difficult part till death claims them or Allah ordains for them some other way. Well, what the commentators mostly note on this is that it doesn't just say let them die. It says or God will work out some other thing for them. So it's it, there's not a period after just confine them and let them die. It's like Allah is merciful keeps getting repeated, and let Allah figure it out and provide a way for this thing to be resolved. Um, the uh, other thing that's pointed out here is that 
the common practice, what was the common practice in the seventh century and maybe the first century for adultery, fornication, some problem like this? Um, stoning, right. So here we have the Quran. It looks like it's really harsh. Confine them until death or something else happens. It's actually trying to prevent stoning. It's trying to prevent a situation where, oh, she is caught in the act of adultery, which we had in John chapter 8 in the Christian Bible. And so we get to stone her. Not him, but her. But here we have do this in this situation. So it, if you read it as don't run out and stone her or him, but handle it this way with witnesses. So um, basically there are, there are careful ways to understand the Quran using the culture of the seventh century and what the message from God was dealing with and how it tried to help people, especially women in that culture, versus um, just a sloppy way of saying, oh goody, um, we get to stone or we get to confine or beat. Um, let's move on to um, the issue. Do we have time to do? Probably not. We probably don't have time to discuss the issue of uh, the hijab and the veiling within this culture. But those are passages that we'll talk about probably a week from today after you turn in your papers and after we um, look at Little Mosque on the Prairie. So that's all for today, and we'll continue looking at women in the world.